Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plan and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Amen. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but this the word of the Lord endures forever. Let us pray. Lord, we do give you praise and honor. I just hit me halfway through that. I forgot the doxology, but we do give you praise and honor. You're worthy of these things. And so, Lord, as we come to this uh, final sermon on the book of Jonah, at least at this point in time, we are grateful for your speaking to us so many uh, wise and gracious things, warning us on the one side and then holding out your character and your power uh, on the other. And so, Lord, give us the faith to embrace you and these words that we might walk in a manner that is pleasing to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. That's about how fast things uh, go out of my mind. I was sitting there, I was waiting for uh, Steve to bring, and I was like, okay, the doxology is next. And that was the last time I thought about that until I was about halfway through and I saw that word discomfort, and I thought, I'm feeling some discomfort. What did I forget? I was like, the doxology. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we started the book of Jonah back several months ago. And... You know, it's one of those books that if you were out and about, let's say that I was back at Amazon, and I asked somebody, what's the book, have you ever heard of the book of Jonah? Have you ever heard of the Bible? Have you ever heard of the book of Jonah? And if they said yes, and I've heard of Jonah, I would say, what's that book about? And they would say, a big fish. Jonah was swallowed by a big fish. And that is absolutely true. It's, it's in there. But what I hope and what I pray that as we have worked slowly through this book, that that is a, a peripheral uh, truth. It, it, is, it is just a very minor point compared to what God is, is displaying to Jonah and through Jonah in this passage. So we've learned uh, a lot in Jonah. There is much here in this book. One of the things that if we were just to read it straight through all at one time, which I'm not going to do, but if we did, we would find that God is very sovereign. And let me get this going here so I'll keep up with what I'm doing. God is sovereign. He is in absolute control of every circumstance and situation in this book. Now, who, who, who wrote the book of Jonah? 
you know, the Holy Spirit influenced Jonah to write this passage. And so all of these things Jonah has learned. He's written this probably when he got back to the northern kingdom, back to his hometown, and he wrote down all the things that the Holy Spirit led him to say. And one of them was that his God is absolutely sovereign over all events. And so I want to ask you this. Who is sovereign over the wind and over the storms? Who is sovereign over disobedient servants? Does God allow you to run away? He does, but only as far as he wants you to run, right? He's, a, he's sovereign over those things. He may let you run a little while. He may let you run a few days. He may let you run for a lifetime. But, it, but you end your running as soon as he says, you're done. And that's what he did with Jonah. He allowed him to run, but only so far, until he reeled him back in uh, with his power and dominion. Who's sovereign over pagan sailors? People who didn't know Yahweh, were in covenant with Yahweh, who called out to their own gods halfway through the storm out of fear and anxiety. And yet the Lord is still sovereign over them. Who's sovereign over massive fish that can swallow a man whole? Who is sovereign over breakers and waves? Who is sovereign over over life and over death. Who's sovereign over the fruitfulness of ministry in which four Hebrew words were uttered and at least a minimum of 120,000 people repented. Who is sovereign over that repentance? Who's sovereign over the politics of a great national power and of a very strong king who puts on sackcloth and sits in ashes and calls that everyone do the same? Who is sovereign over a vine, a gourd, a plant, maybe a cucumber. Who is sovereign over a worm? Who is sovereign over the wind? Who is sovereign over all creation to build up and to tear down, to harden, but also to forgive? And so what we find just in that little simple assessment is that God is in absolute control at all times, in all ways, over all people and all things in the book of Jonah. And that's just a snapshot of his divine sovereignty over all things at all times. He's that great. He's that big, he's that strong, he's that knowledgeable, he's that wise. And this is the God of Jonah, this is the God of the Bible, this is the God of creation, and this is our God, the God who is over the church. Now what we see in this particular passage, uh, Jonah chapter 4, is that every detail is orchestrated that it's going to fall out exactly as the Lord has planned it. And so, you know, there would be a question, is, is God sovereignty? Is God sovereign? Or is, does man have responsibility? And a lot of people try to work those against each other. Uh, if, if God is sovereign, then man has no responsibility. Or if man's uh, you know, free to do as he pleases, then God obviously couldn't have all power or authority or dominion. And yet in the Bible, and we know it in our lives, those are equally true. They're not opposite of each other. In fact, uh, somebody asked Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher, like, um, you know, what do you think about, how, how do you, how do you, uh, 
uh, consolidate these two things? How, how do you bring peace between these two opposing ideas? And he said, well, I don't ever have to make friends agree. They're in perfect harmony and unity in the Lord. It may be beyond us, but not in him. And so we see uh, some freedom that Jonah has in his life to go and do and to feel particular ways, but he is hemmed in at every point by the Lord. And he actually then accomplishes the very thing God wants for him to accomplish. The Lord allows him to be this obstinate, stiff-necked prophet, and still the Lord uses him. But every detail of his life is orchestrated. Understand also that every detail of our, of our lives is equally orchestrated by God. There is nothing outside of his power or control. There is no uh, authority, uh, no, no civil government, no, um, no political faction, no idea, no ism that God does not have under his complete and utter control. He's got all things under his thumb, so to speak. And he may allow things to find their place in this world. He's allowed sin to enter to the world. He's allowed death to enter the world. He's allowed all these terrible things to enter the world, but they are still under his control and he will still use them for his own glory. And when he says the word, he will put a full and final end to those things and they will not be able to withstand it and they will not be able to oppose him. And so the application for that is that every detail of your life is under God's sovereign control. Every single thing is under his controlling, powerful, loving, generous, good, knowledgeable, wise hand. And so I would encourage you, relax you're not God. He's God. Let him be God. But trust him. Exercise faith in him. Walk in faithful obedience to his revealed will for you to bring about his glory in your life. Whatever circumstances he brings your way, it will be for his glory and it will be for your good. Give thanks in all circumstances for... This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. We can trust him to bring about a good outcome to our lives. We can trust him. And so as we think about Jonah, we think about God's fatherly kindness to Jonah. Jonah has been through a lot from chapter 1 to the middle of chapter 4. I don't know the timeline. But I guarantee it's a long time. It, it, was a, it was an enormous trip from where he lived to Nineveh, and then he ran south for a period of time, and then he was involved in all of that, and then still had to get there. And so, I mean, it could have been at least a year, if not longer. And we see God being a kind, generous father to him in the ways and the areas that he needed it. He didn't abandon Jonah. He judged Jonah, but he also delivered Jonah. He shows a fatherly kindness to Jonah, his child. Treats him with, uh, with grace and with mercy. Displays his character to Jonah as a, a God who is slow to anger. As a God who has what's called hesed, has grace, has mercy. Visits goodness upon somebody who doesn't earn it and is not worthy of it because the heart of the Lord is just like that, showing kindness. And that way nobody could accuse God of only rewarding those who are good people and punishing the wicked. No, he is generous and kind to even Jonah, even people like us, showing that it's his heart and it's his motive to do people good and kind. He's a picture of this would be the prodigal son's father in Luke 15 
out in the backyard with the older brother. Now, I remind you of that story. The younger brother has come in and has told the father, go ahead and give me my inheritance. Uh, I'm, I need to leave. I'm, I need to get out of here. And so the father divided his inheritance with the two boys. Did the younger brother deserve that inheritance? The answer is no. The father gave it to him anyway. And he left and he squandered it all. And then he was in the far country, wine, women, and song, wasted everything. And in the end, he was feeding pigs and was hungry just for the, the slop that he was giving the pigs. And then, and then, basically, the idea is the Holy Spirit convicted him and brought him to his senses. And he went home. And the father had been waiting for him and restored him completely out of grace and mercy and kindness because that's the picture of the kindness of the Father, the heavenly Father, that Jesus was talking to the tax collectors and the Pharisees about. This is what God is like. He wants people to come home that He might restore them and bless them, that He might shower His grace upon them that he might be magnified in his mercy to unworthy people. And do you remember what the older brother did? The party began to rage. The fattened calf was slaughtered. The fire was built. It's how many steaks do you want? The smell would have been wonderful. They would have had wine. They would have been rejoicing. They would have had neighbors over because the younger brother was dead, but now he's alive. He's come home, and the father is overjoyed. And the older brother stands out in the field, out in the backyard, angry about the father being so generous and so kind. But the father goes out to him. The father initiates um, reconciliation with the younger son by running out to him and weeping on his shoulder and putting a robe on him and a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, restoring him to a position of authority, bringing him back into the family. And the older brother, he goes out to him too. To say, I love people on the left side, and I love people on the right side. I love people because that's my heart. And so he goes out and begins to reason with the older brother. He didn't have to do it, but the, that was just a picture of the father. And that's the picture that we have in the book of Jonah with God dealing with Jonah. He is an older brother. He is angry about God and the kindness of God towards sinners. And he has failed to remember or to know or to sense or to feel that he is also one of those people. And the father is out there showing his kindness. Now in what ways do we see God's kindness what ways do we see his grace? What ways do we see his mercy? What ways do we see his long suffering and his training of Jonah? Well, what we see uh, in this passage in particular uh, is dialogue. There's not a whole lot of it, but there is quite a bit here in chapter 4. The Lord is asking him questions. Does the Lord know? his heart? Does the Lord know his mind? Absolutely. There is nothing hidden from the Lord. No thought, no motive, no idea, no, no nothing. The Lord sees and knows it all. It's clear and open before him. And so he's asking Jonah these questions to draw Jonah out. Are you doing well to be angry? Is this a good thing? Do you see this as a good thing? Do you feel like it's a good thing for you to be angry, those types of things? In other words, God actually talks to Jonah, the high God, the one who created all things, the one whose uh, footstool is the earth as he sits on his throne uh, in the heavenly realms. That's a picture of his grandeur and his largeness and his authority. 
that the earth he has on the bottom of his feet. But he has a conversation with him. This goes all the way back to Genesis 1 where God designs and creates and fashions mankind with the capacity for relationship. And God wants to have that relationship with Jonah and actually listens to him talk. Just like Job complaining. Just like anybody else, the Lord comes as this fatherly, tender character who has, who has all power and yet also has a listening ear for his servants. He also orders Jonah's circumstances in order to train Jonah, to train him. He allows Jonah to see and to feel that his response to the character of God is both obnoxious and over the top when he says in verse 9, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. Now, if we were to think about this just in normal everyday situations, Having conversations with people who are in that state of mind is extremely taxing. Um, it's, it's just very unenjoyable. It will suck the life out of you. And if you've ever been in a work environment like that, or if you've ever had to be around people who uh, are just angry or obnoxious, or frustrated all the time, they will, they will attempt to visit that emotion on you. You have the freedom to not receive it. Just because it's displayed doesn't mean you have to receive it. But normally we take stuff on and then we feel it as well. But God here, God has this conversation with Jonah. It requires effort. It requires energy. It requires exposure. And it requires a cost to the Lord. Because this type of behavior is sin. And somebody is going to pay for that. And yet, in the kindness of the Lord, he wants to visit mercy upon Jonah. He wants to maintain the relationship. He wants to, he wants to pull Jonah out of this idolatrous mindset, this judgmental mindset, and have him walk in accord with the character and the purposes of God in all of life, but in particular with the Ninevites at this particular moment. God can squash the Ninevites at any moment as surely he is, he squashed Sodom and Gomorrah. But at this moment, at this day and time, in the, in the late 8th century B.C., he wants to show the Assyrian Empire, number one, that he is God and that he is merciful and that he is gracious and that he is kind. That's what he wanted to show them at this time. Later on, he will show them his power and dominion and authority, but not at this moment. Notice God does not abandon Jonah in this passage as well. He did not abandon the pagan sailors in their idolatry, but showed them mercy and deliverance. He did not abandon the Ninevites in their wickedness and sin, but had the word preached to them and brought them to repentance. And now we see him striving with Jonah in his anger and his frustration. It shows, it shows the, the powerful character of God. There is something great about people who can be in those types of situations and be perfectly at peace, perfectly at rest, perfectly secure without having to inherit the negativity or the anger of the other person. Susie and I went to Ukraine in 1996, and I'm, I may have told you this, but I'm still amazed by it. Um, we took 15 college students uh, from all across the country, um, and we went with InterVarsity. They had to apply and be approved to go. They had to have uh, spiritual maturity. They had to be able to share their faith. 
and those types of things. And we took 15 students from across America, met up in Atlanta and flew and stayed for about six weeks on the Black Sea in Ukraine. And we met up with 15 students from Odessa State University. And it was, almost, it was a cultural exchange type of thing and uh, our students would go home with them on the weekends and uh, just you know, see the city, uh, hang out together. We took Russian, they took English. Uh, we did um, uh, games together. We studied the Bible together, those types of things. And our hope was to um, share the gospel uh, with those people. But Bruce Allwood was the director from our side. He was the regional director for InterVarsity in East Tennessee. And then on his counterpart, who came from Odessa State University, uh, Mr. Grinevich was probably the angriest person I have ever met in my whole life. He was terse, violent acting, rude, obnoxious. Um, he, it was just like I just did not want to be anywhere around him at all. There, were, there was no reasoning with him. There was no talking with him. There was no conversation. It was just this uh, flamethrower. And I can still remember Bruce Allwood sitting cool as a cucumber, just talking to him, listening to him, reasoning with him, befriending him. And at the end, it was just like, at the end, I remember asking Bruce, how did you do that for that long? And his response was basically, I just figured God was in control. And I just, I just wanted to honor the Lord with who I was and how I treated this man. And then what he did with that was up to him. But that's, that's what I thought the whole time. And I just, I looked at that and I look at this and I see that was the Lord. That was the Holy Spirit at work in Bruce Allwood's life, giving him that peace and security that he didn't have to, he didn't have to fix it at that moment. The Lord was going to take care of it. And here with Jonah, we have that Lord in Jonah's life displaying to him how to treat other people respectfully, kindly. And of course, the Lord's going to get his way, but it's a good way, and it's the right way. And Jonah, why don't you get on board with this good and right way? And so the Lord strives with Jonah. He strives with you and me. He did not abandon Jonah ever. Not when he fled to Tarshish and was on the ship. Not when he was sinking down underneath the ocean and his life was ebbing away. Did not abandon him. Did not abandon him when he went and preached in Nineveh. But stood with him in the power of the Holy Spirit and made that preached word effective and effectual. And now in Jonah chapter 4 when Jonah is perturbed about the whole thing, God still does not abandon his servant. Now for me, I just say praise the Lord. Because if, if the Lord wanted to, he would have reason after reason after reason to abandon me and people like me. Sinful people, disobedient people, obnoxious people, angry people, greedy people. You can just go down the list. Think about your sins that you confess to the Lord every day and he, he, could just, he could just stack them up. And you know, but for the grace of God, the Lord would abandon me. But he's grieved over the fact that we're separate from him or we're estranged from him. Or that we're not walking in harmony with him. And he has resolved in and of himself, because of Jesus Christ, to endure with us. And to keep us. And to deliver us. And to bless us for his own name's sake. And as a reward that he will give us to Jesus Christ. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you because of the greatness of his character 
and the sufficiency of the work of Jesus. Let that motivate you then and motivate me into greater acts of faith and obedience. That he is that good. He is that kind. He really does have good for us in his word and in his plan for our lives. God uses means in this book and in this chapter. We've talked about wind and storm and waves and fish and ocean depths and the preaching of the word. And here in chapter 4 we see there is a scorching sun and a wind and a worm and a vine. Uh, what he's doing here is he, is he is bringing about practical events. He's bringing everyday occurrences and his, so that we might understand his providence. Uh, when we see Jonah in this book, we would think, this could be me too. I've been on a boat. I've felt the waves. I've felt the wind. I've seen vines. I've seen a worm. I've, you know, sit out in a tent. I, all these types of things. I've interacted with other people pagan people, uh, believers. Uh, I might not have met the most powerful civil people in the world, but Jonah didn't meet the king either. He just met common ordinary people. News reached the king. And it's just all these circumstances woven together uh, by the, the mind of God and the power of God, which we call the providence of God. And what God wants to reveal to him is that as he interacts with these common circumstances, there will be a revelation to him of what he is like. I'm not talking about God. I'm talking about God will show Jonah what Jonah is really like just with common, ordinary circumstances. And God is going to argue with Jonah and the northern kingdom and you and me from the lesser to the greater. And so here's what that means. What is our greatest problem? You don't have to answer, just think about it. What, what is my, what's the greatest problem that I have right now? And so, you know, if, if we took a poll, if we just went out on the street, uh, if we went up to um, Main Street and had a microphone and we recorded people, we'd say, all right, what's, uh, what's, what's, what's your biggest problem right now? And just let people answer. They would say, COVID, the economy. They would say, the government. They would say, my job, my bank account. They would say, uh, I'm sick. Um, in a bad marriage, and they would just name all these types of things. And those things would be true, but that's not going to be the worst thing. That's not going to be, that is not going to be their greatest problem because those problems will go away when their life ends. Our greatest problem is a sin problem, and I'm going to name that sin, okay? This is our greatest problem. Our greatest problem is that I think I'm God, and I want to be God. That is the operation of Adam and Eve's sin in the lives of all people except for Jesus Christ. And if you are God, it's fine to know you're God. But if you're not God, that is a great evil. That is a great evil. And so what that means, what God does here with Jonah and what he does in our lives, and I want to make this very practical, is that Jonah thinks he's God and he's making determinations about what he thinks needs to happen with the Ninevites, which is judgment. So Jonah thinks he's right about what needs to happen to the Ninevites and then he's angry with God when the true God does what the true God wants to do with the Ninevites because Jonah still hasn't got the message that that's not his place. He doesn't know these people. He doesn't know anything about the, the plan of God for these people throughout history. He's just living in the moment. And so God comes to him to show him his desires and how those desires may be true desires. They're real. He really feels them. But there's the wrong intent with those feelings, those desires, those judgments, those motives. 
this behavior, this mindset. Do you do well to be angry? You know, are you angry? Yes, that's an emotion. We're not going to argue about that. But do you do well to be angry in this situation? Is this righteousness? Is this holiness? Jonah, does this type of anger, um, does this honor me and what I'm wanting to do as I magnify my character among these pagan people? If we were to look at this text, we would see something about Jonah. So look at verse 6. It says, The Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah so that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his what? His discomfort. Jonah is very uncomfortable in this particular place and time. He doesn't like what God did by relenting to send calamity on the Ninevites. And now he does not feel in his body comfort because of the sun and the heat. And he is, he is uncomfortable in all aspects of who he is. He is not a happy camper at all. And so God, look, God appoints a plant. Here we go. We see the sovereignty of God in control of all things. God's got a plan. Read that here. God has a plan for Jonah to show Jonah something about Jonah. So he makes a plant. It comes up over Jonah to relieve him uh, of discomfort, i.e. to make him more comfortable. Right? What does Jonah want? Jonah wants comfort. He wants ease. He wants, uh, if you took it farther, he probably wants pleasure. He wants freedom from negative circumstances. Uh, even though, even though he is a sinner. Is that desire only true of believers? Or might those desires also be true of unbelievers? Ease, comfort, affluence, pleasure, freedom from negative circumstances, alleviation of pain. That is just a natural human desire. And God begins to show him in this moment that he can alleviate and relieve him of his discomfort and give him something enjoyable. Now, here's the thing. As we, as we are given these types of things from God. Every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father of heavenly lights. Every good thing that we receive has come from God's hand. He appoints a plant for Jonah to relieve him of his discomfort, but he appoints all kinds of other things to relieve us of our discomfort every single day. Have you ever been so hungry that you just didn't know how you were going to make it? Mm -mm. No, no, I don't think any of us have. I don't think so. Every single day. As the Lord provides for us in that very basic way, understand we prayed early, give us this day our daily bread. Now whether we actually think of that while we're praying it or whether it's just words, guess who's honoring their side of that constantly, the Lord, every day, every day, meeting our needs to bless us, to show us his kindness, to, to display to the watching world and the angelic hosts and anybody that is able to understand, God is so good to those people. They take such advantage of him and he does not care. He just, it's just his loving heart. But the point is, is that as we are, as we receive the kindness of the Lord, it should be in our mind another reason to give him thanks, to give him praise, to be grateful. What types of people don't write thank you notes? <laughs> yeah. People who think they deserve what they got. 
Like, I don't, you know, do you write your employer to say thank you for my paycheck this week when I work, you know, the last two weeks for 80 hours? Nobody does that. It's like if you don't get your check on time, there's, there's a row, you know, that happens. But you don't say thank you to things you think that you deserve or you earned. It's, it's, not, it's not a gift. It is something that they should have given you. And God begins to show Jonah in this passage um, kindness, mercy, generosity, taking care of him, blessing him. And so Jonah is what in verse 7, or verse 6, the end? He is exceedingly glad. He's not just happy. He's not just glad. He's just not comfortable. He is overjoyed. Now remember, who's writing this book? Jonah. What else did he say about himself in this book? I was furious. I was angry. I was so mad. I was like Cain. I wanted to kill somebody. But for that plant, whoo, man, I was so happy. So happy. I love that plant, and I hated those people. That's some real honesty there. I think it takes the Holy Spirit <laughs> to get to that point where you're like, that's what I was like. That's where my heart was. I was that kind of person. Grateful for the smallest, most minute things. But angry against other people and things that are more valuable in God's economy than a plant with a large leaf. And what God's doing in this passage with Jonah is he is teaching him and training him, love like I love Jonah, love like I love, like the right things. You love something, things make you joyful, so I know that your emotions are there and intact, but they're misplaced. Your affections are misplaced. You love the wrong thing. The wrong things make you glad. And the right things make you very angry. So once again, here's the Lord out in the backyard with the elder brother saying, Won't you come in and join the party that I am throwing? for people who desperately need mercy because I love them greatly. So how does this end? How does this end? I want you to look at this, and I will, I'll be really brief with this, but this, this to me, like I was thinking about this yesterday, and I thought it was very, very interesting. How does, how does the end of the book of Jonah come to a conclusion. Um, it ends with a question. That to me is really very interesting. Is that how you think books of the Bible end? Like a question. Normally it's like, you know, yeah, they got what they, you know, they were due, or there's a warning, or, or there's, a, there's a greeting, or, you know, we can just work through all the, there's, but a question? It almost makes it seem like there needs to be a chapter 5. That's, the, that's actually the way the book of Acts is written. It, it's like you get to the end of the book of Acts and you're like... And the story is being written in the lives of God's people under the power of the Holy Spirit, although it's not inscripturated. But here, God asks... Jonah, a question. So what does a question achieve? Well, the first thing that it does is if you ask somebody a question, it makes them think. It makes them think. It's not a statement. They don't have to react to it in some form or fashion in that particular moment. But it makes them begin to think and to ponder about what the questioner offered them. And in this, in this, God does make a statement, Jonah, your emotions are out of whack. 
Your affections are out of whack. Your heart is out of whack. There's the statement. And then he asks him a question. Should I not pity Nineveh? Should I not pity them? Not reward them from bad behavior, but pity them. There's 120,000 people minimum there and a lot of cattle who are of greater value to me than that plant that you loved so much, that brought you great joy, that made you very happy. Will you allow me, Jonah, as God Almighty, to have those same affections for these people that I want to show mercy to? Will you allow me to do that. And so basically this book ends with the ball being put in Jonah's court to decide where his heart will go from here. It's put in the court of the northern kingdom as how they will treat their neighbors. And it's put in our court as people in the church to say, will we get on board with this God who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and who relents from disaster, but who will by no means leave you know, the guilty unpunished, he's going to take care of that. We don't have to worry about that. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. But will we get on, on board with him and his kindness to sinful people? And will we say, Lord, I want to be on board with you. And will you use me to herald this kindness that you've shown me? Will you use me to share it with other people, whether they be my next door neighbor or whether they be around the globe. Lord, I want to be on board with you. And if we were the younger brother in Luke 15, or the older brother in Luke 15, when the father said, will you not come in? We could be honest, say, I was very angry, but I see your kindness, and I love my brother. I would like to come in. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you have been so kind to us over these months as we've studied through Jonah. Uh, there's a lot to uh, take in and to meditate on and to grow from. Um, we're probably a lot like Jonah, uh, more like Jonah than Jesus, I'm sure. But uh, don't leave us alone. Don't abandon us. Grow us, mature us into people who reflect your loving heart to those around us. We don't have to... Um, be untruthful about sin. No, we can, but we can admit ours as well. Uh, and then point people to a God who forgives and heals and atones and saves. And so, Lord, we're grateful for your kindness uh, to Jonah and to your kindness to us in Jesus. So we make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.